Covenant Church. Let's put our hands together and celebrate for the King.
draw near to us. God, we want to be close to you, Lord. We want to be close to you, Father. We thank you for your love this morning. We thank you for sending your son. We thank you for making a way for us to be close to you. Just bless your name this morning.
Here in your presence 
hearts, Jesus. We bow all that we are, Father. There is no one like you, Jesus. Just tell them right now in your own words, just say, God, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Father. You are wonderful. You're beautiful. You're glorious, God. We lift you up in this place, Jesus. Too. We just sung a song. My only devotion, my, my, my whole devotion, my only focus is to worship you. So do we really believe this? Because when that when we have when that happens, Satan flees, so all your problems are gone. And who is standing in that in, in the place of glory? Jesus in your life. It tells us in Isaiah 66, verse 23, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another. And from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Has it come to pass in your life? It's that time to worship. So when your heart sings out, when your mind is focused on God, he's focused on you. Amen. God, we thank you for this opportunity to worship. We thank you for this amazing outpouring, Lord, that we can give unto you. And you see a beautiful thing. What a sweet smell and aroma it is to you, Father. So, Father, I pray, Father, that we lay down everything and only pick up your spirit in that spirit of worship. Thank you, God, for the blessings you give us. Thank you for the love from you, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now, let's share that love before you're seated. Welcome everyone to New Covenant Church. I see new faces. We're so glad you're here with us today. If you've never been to New Covenant before, we want to say welcome. We extend our welcome to you. As for when you come through the door or when you're seated, we're here to show God's love to everyone who walks through the door. So thank you so much for being a part of this. Who's ready to extend our worship in the area of giving? Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to go ahead and come forward, and as they are, for those of you who are writing checks, simply write that out to New Covenant Church, or NCC for short. And for those who like to uh, give cash, there's a cash envelope in the chair right in front of you. Simply fill that out and drop it in the offering bucket as it comes along. And for those who like to give online, simply go to wearencc.com. Follow the links and give there as well. So whatever you're giving, I just pray that God would just show you his love this week, this month, this year. I just pray that he just love on you and he will. All you have to do is receive. So let's just bow our heads. Thank you, God, for this time that we can give our tithe and our offering, Lord. I pray, Father, that today, Lord, that you just receive everything that we can give. And we ask you just to bless it, God, to reach many more across this country, across this world. And in your name we pray. Amen.
everyone, welcome to New Covenant Church. We are so glad you're with us today. If you're new, have a prayer need, need any information about one of our ministries, or just simply want to connect with the leader, fill out a connect card in the seat pocket in front of you. You can drop it in the box on your way out. Now here are the main things you need to know. Come enjoy a night of extended praise and worship with Thrive Singles Ministry this Friday night at 6 o'clock p.m. right here at New Covenant Church in the Outpost. We invite you to join us for dinner, worship, and fellowship on this special night. If you have any questions, please contact the church office at 903-757-7791. The next step after attending our Spirit Empowered Living class is to take our ID class on the third Sunday of every month at 1015 a.m. in room 116. God has created in each of us a unique spiritual fingerprint that encompasses your gifts, passions, abilities, personality, and life experiences. God is calling you to awaken to the true identity He has for you and to become all He made you to be. For more information, visit id.wearencc.com. The fall semester of Life Groups begins September 10th, and we are so excited about the many new groups launching in September. If you want to start a group, we want to equip you and train you to take what you're already doing in life and bring others into it. Let us help you take your passion and put purpose to it. You can lead a group based around your passions, activities, studies, or stage of life. We have two trainings to choose from on Sunday, August 20th and August 27th during the 1145 service. Here you will get the tools necessary to start and lead a group. Go online to groups.wearencc.com to fill out your application today. To stay up to date with these and other events, visit our website at wearencc.com or follow us on social media. Thank you for being with us today and have a great week. New Covenant. Good to see everybody. Good to see everybody that joins us online today. And, uh, you know, I was just thinking, did we really have summer? I mean, yesterday sure felt like it, didn't it? But uh, we've had the coolest, wettest summer that I can think of, and I've been here quite a few years. And when I see the rain, I always think of God's blessings. Now, some of you might have not felt like it was God's blessings as you were moving from the parking lot into the building. You know, I hugged a few people and they were kind of wet. And, uh, but it's still God's blessings. And thank God you're here. Give yourself a hand for not being good weather, fair weather attendees. Amen. Bless you. Bless you. I love it. I love it. You know, it's amazing sometimes Christians won't come to church because of the weather. And it's like, would you stay home from work, you know? So we're here and I believe that pleases God that we're here to worship Him and to hear from Him. We're in something called uh, God breathed, and I explained that last week, that that refers to the Scripture, that all Scripture is literally God breathed. And I, sh I put a term out there called the canon. The canon is just a, it's just a technical term describing the books that are assembled together in the Bible and why we need it. I briefly mentioned the fact that why the books that we have, the 66 books of the Old and New Testament are included, why others were excluded. I can't do that justice in a, in a Sunday morning message. But, but, but why we need the Bible. And I got into all that. And if you miss that, don't miss it. Go back and get it. Go online. You can get audio, video. You can get notes, etc. Now, we have notes here uh, as well, uh, our U version app. Some of you use. I understand we've had problems getting our notes online, so you can go to our Facebook and link into the U version notes there if you want to follow me live. Because I've got all the notes. If you want to follow the notes, if you want, I've got all the we've got all the notes online. So if you don't want to have to take a lot of notes, just take a few. You can follow what we've already written down. So I want to follow this up today with a question. When we talk about the Bible, our goal this week, this month, is to get us into the scripture and in it into us in a way that helps us grow. So here's the question I want to propose to you. Of all the things the Bible teaches, what do you believe is the most important message? You know, the Bible teaches a lot of things. In fact, we're told everything we need for life and knowledge is found in, life and godliness is found in the scripture. So it's a, it's a really good handbook for life. But 
pick one, one theme, one message. What is it? What is the most important message in the Bible? Let me give you a clue what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 26. He said, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You really can't escape the logic of this, can you? Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. The most important message in the Bible is how are we saved? How does a person become saved? Maybe you grew up in churches and you heard salvation messages your whole life. Maybe you grew up in church or didn't grow up in church or the church you grew up in didn't talk a lot about that. It was real vague. I fear it's too vague today. And if that is the case, it must not be the case. This is not something we cannot know. And I want to give you, first of all, why we need to know this. Why this is so important that we know how a person is saved. Now, I know most of you probably are saved. But here's the question. Do you know how to share that with somebody else in a moment of time? If it is the most important message in the Bible, do we understand it enough that we can share it or articulate it? And, of course, know it for ourselves. Let me give you three reasons why we must know this. Number one, man in his natural state is lost. Our natural state is not saved. If, if we leave, if we're left alone, it won't end well. If we do what is natural, it will not end well. The Bible is pervasively and consistently clear about this. That we, outside of God, are lost. Our default condition is, is lost. Now, why is that important? Being lost, here's the second reason, being lost has terrible consequences. You know, we've all made choices, right, in life. <clears throat> and some choice, you know, we've made choices in it. Oh, I'm suffering because I made a bad decision. But nothing compares to this decision. Even if you made a bad choice in your marriage or bad choice in your finances or bad choice in your career or, or friends or you did something, you made a, you know, you were careless and there was an accident or something. Nothing comes close to this. Being lost has terrible consequences both now and forever. You know, being saved has amazing consequences both now and forever. So is being lost on the other side of the spectrum. And no one, this is, you know, the Bible talks about the, the eternal punishment of the lost. And it is horrible. It is so horrible that I think most people block it out of their minds, even Christians. But let me just say, no one spoke more passionately and in more detail about hell than Jesus himself. Jesus is much more descriptive about hell than heaven. And you know that makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you go to heaven, you're not going to need a description you know, it'll be awesome. But if, to avoid a person going to hell, we need some motivation. <laughs> and Jesus is handing it to us. You know, you hear people who really think they're cool today says, well, I just can't believe in literal hell, you know. That's just no. You know, that's just not, that's just not a, a popular, fashionable thing to believe anymore, even in, sometimes in some churches. Uh, or, you know, they, they, just think it, they just think that's that we've outgrown that. Well, you better listen to Jesus here. In Mark 9, 47, look at what he says. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. This is many scriptures. I'm just picking this one. It, it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus spoke of hell as being suffering, conscious, conscious, eternal suffering. It is not smart for us not to think about hell. No matter where we are, whether we're saved or lost, it is just not smart. Now, I shared with you last week, our reasoning powers are darkened if we're away from God. We don't think as rationally as we do think we should. I was lost for 18 years. What kind of a sane, rational person would allow themselves to be lost at the imminent, with the imminent possibility of going forever into hell. What kind of person would put himself at that level of risk? There is no do-over. There is no 
reset. There, it, it's it. It's over. And forever, all I have to think about in my place of suffering is the choice I passed up continually to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of my life and the ample opportunities that were given to me. That's irrational. You don't, it doesn't matter what kind of IQ you have. Our reasoning powers, as I shared last week, are blunted and dulled by our fact of being alienated from the very life of God. You can't, how many agree? That's, that's, that's just logical. And we think we're so rational, and we're not. We're, we're, we're if this is real, and, and, and I don't know where you stand on the subject of hell, and I don't know who you're listening to, but can I just tell you where I am? I'm going with Jesus on this one. Even if I sometimes can't get my head around, I'm going with Jesus. I'm going to learn more about it, but I'm going with Jesus, the one who is God himself. If he says it, I'm going to go with him. And if I'm wrong, I'm okay. But this is not something you want to be wrong about if you don't believe in a hell and there is one. I'd rather believe in one there not be, which is not the case because Jesus said there was. So this, there's terrible consequences to being lost. Here's another thing that I think will help us all today. Getting this right delivers us from both false security and false insecurity, and we can be guilty of both, and I have been in both places, and perhaps you have too. We can have false security, and we can have false insecurity. So how do we understand what salvation really is? Before I tell you the how-to, I need to tell you what it actually is. The way of salvation. There's two things that the Bible says over and over in the New Testament about what salvation really is. Number one, it was purchased by the death of Jesus on the cross. It was basically bought with his blood. There's a word we use in the Bible called redemption. And it simply means to be purchased. You know, I was, when I was a kid, we had stamps. We had, I don't know if they were green stamps. Anybody remember the stamps? Was it green stamps? Help me out here, okay? So the, the deal was you go to a store and they give you these stamps. And if you collect enough stamps, you can go get stuff, right? Like blenders and irons and all kinds of stuff. Can't live without. If you got enough stamps. So what they call these places where you go get the stamps, redemption centers. You redeem, you purchase with the stamps. So that's, that was a word that used to be used to buy things. You know, we still use it occasionally, redeem your coupon, redeem your ticket. So we were redeemed, Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. <clears throat> when you begin to study the real issue of salvation, and I did this early in my relationship with God, I began to realize it dawned on me that this is basically, and don't take this wrong, but you need to understand this. This is a legal transaction. Before you can have the experiential, you have to have the legal. How many of you have a home you live in and you enjoy it? You're an owner, or at least you pay the mortgage of that home. All right, before you could have the, the enjoyment of the experience of that home, you had to have the legal transaction. You can't just move in. And there has to be a legal transaction for our salvation, and it has to be paid for. And the only payment that could be sufficient is the innocent blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know all the reasons for this, but I know the Bible teaches this. And all cultures, see, in the 21st century, we have a hard time with this. We try to get all emotional about the blood. I get emotional about the blood, but, but all, even ancient cultures understood blood sacrifice. We, we grew up without it in the sophisticated world we live in now. But primitive cultures still do it. The Jewish culture did it up until the time of Christ. <clears throat> and Hebrews 9.22 explains it. Indeed, according to the law, almost everything was purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So if someone says, I don't need to go through Jesus, then I say, the blood cleanses our sins. What are you looking for to cleanse your sins? And if you don't try the blood, you're going to try your own good works. You're hoping your good works outweigh your bad works. And the Bible is clear that's not going to happen. We're all lost. We've all sinned. And the only one antidote to sin, only one purifying instrument 
and that is the blood of Jesus. So the first thing we have to understand about our salvation is purchased with the act of Jesus on the cross, shedding his innocent blood for our guilty sins. But the second thing is we have to understand about salvation. It is not divorced. It is not an act that he just did and he walked away from it and hopefully we'll believe it at some point in our life on this journey we're in. We're in this pilgrimage of our earthly existence. But it is not divorced from him as a person. You have to go through a person. It is around and through a person. John 14, 6, many of you know this. I am the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you don't get what he did on the cross apart from him. That's why we say to people, you need to invite Jesus in your life. Some people say, just, just believe that he died on the cross for you. Well, I always believed that he died on the cross for me. How many of you believed he died on the cross for you before you got saved? A long time before you got saved. Just curious. Me too. So you weren't saved. Because you just said, I believed it before, a long time before. So believing in the fact of the cross doesn't save you. And you'll hear some theologians trying to get it. They're just overworking themselves trying to convince us that's all we need to do. That's not all we need to do. You have to receive the person. He's the way. What he did for you does not come apart from him. So we say invite him into your life. All right. Paul, interestingly, this is fascinating. On Acts 17, he's on this hill. It's called Mars Hill. It's this big, like Harvard of the day, right? Everybody sat around and debated who was the smartest. And this is what he said to these guys who were basically idol worshipers. Acts 17, 30. Truly, the times of ignorance in the past God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Did you know everyone is required to repent? I'll get that in a minute. Because he has appointed a day, notice the language here, in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man, Jesus, whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So let's just be real clear about this. What you do with Jesus determines whether you're saved or not. That's the question. Not did you steal, rob, lie. If we st steal, rob, lie, which we've done, that'll come up, okay? That'll come up on our personal YouTube, right? We'll, that's going to happen. But then the question is whether you have to pay the penalty for that or not, is what did you do with Jesus? Now, I don't know if they still say this, but how many of you have heard people say something like, well, I just think it's narrow-minded to think that you have to go through Jesus. How many of you have ever heard that? Maybe you struggle with that. That just seems wrong. That you have to go through. Why should I accept your Jesus? It's like, well, he's not mine. I didn't make him up. And if it's not Jesus, who do you want? Well, there's just got to be lots of ways. Well, why? Well, it's just not right. Why? I love what Jonathan Edwards said, the great Puritan preacher in the 1600s. He said... If God provided a means for our salvation through His Son, and we do not want that means, is God obligated to give us another means? He is not, is He? Why? What's wrong with Jesus? And most of the time people say, well, that's narrow mind, and there's got to be lots of roads, or there is lots of roads. They act like they all of a sudden know themselves. There is lots of roads. So what road are you taking? Well, there's just lots. Well, which one do you take? Well, there's just lots. And it's a smokescreen. It's like, I don't want to do anything about my life right now, so I'm just going to say it can't be one way. It's like, I don't want to go across that bridge. I don't want to go anywhere. So I'm saying, you're narrow-minded to say you have to go across that bridge. But the Bible is very clear. It is through the blood of Jesus, and it's through the person of Jesus. It is around what he did and who he is, and we have to accept both. And that's how we are saved. Now, what's our part? How many know everything I just said is God's part? God gave us his son, and his son shed his blood on the cross. That's God's part. There are some who think that's all that matters. God's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. And we have no part to play. It's just if we're meant to be saved, we'll be saved. If we're not meant to be saved, we'll be lost. It's just going to happen because God's strong and we're not. But I don't believe the Bible teaches. In fact, I know the Bible does not teach that. And there is a part. How many know we have a part? So if you were to help your best friend know what their part is, would you know what to tell them? We've already agreed there is nothing more important than this. And can I just help you today? By boiling this down to two words that the Bible, I think, gives us over and over and over. 
This has got to be crystal clear because there is nothing more important than this. All right? Our part, two words, repentance and faith. Or repent and believe, however you want to put it, the verb or the noun. Repentance and faith. Repent and believe. A couple of scriptures, which we could give you many. I don't have the time to do it. Mark 1.14, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Two words. Acts 20.21, 20, Paul said this at kind of toward the end of his life. He says, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. That's our pattern. That's their pattern. It's our pattern. We want to meet here on Sunday. We want to have life groups throughout the week, publicly and from house to house, okay? Testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So what do these two words mean? Repentance means literally in the Greek language, turning around. Ever been lost? Like on a road, that's before iPhones and GPSs. We still get lost, don't we? There's just no excuse. How did this happen? And when you're lost, you gotta, you got you got one choice. You can go into denial. Well, I think you're judging me right now by saying I'm lost. Or you can turn around. But I've been going a long ways this direction. Do you know how humbling it is to admit that I've gone all this way in the wrong direction? I can't admit that. How much gas have I burned? People look to me as a leader. Stay lost. Or that's what it means. It means to turn around. Being saved in this sense is not like we see on HGTV, you know, fixer-upper or flipper-flop, or we save a house. We kind of go in and we... We fix it up and paint it and tear down some stuff and put new counters and cabinets in. We're going to save that house. That's not what, it's not like that, okay? It's very radical. It means you turn around. You have to let go of what you've been doing. Let go, really, of who you are. So, so it can happen in a prayer, but it's more than just a prayer. It's a commitment. Look what Jesus taught us. Matthew 16, 25, 26. For whoever desires to save, hang on to, cling to his life, will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Reverse logic. If I've been going the wrong way, the longer I've been going the wrong way, the more crazy it's going to seem. And the more radical, in fact, it will be for me to do this. When a three-year-old loses his life, it's not a big deal. When a 30-year-old loses his life, it's a bigger deal. When a 60-year-old loses his life, it's a big deal. Because in essence, they're admitting, all these years, I've done it wrong. But if you're lost, if you're lost, you got to turn around. Keep going the same direction because of pride. It's not going to save you. You're not going to get there. It's a powerful, powerful thing that has been left out, I'm afraid, of many presentations of the gospel. Just believe, friend. First, you've got to be willing to turn around. 2 Corinthians 5.17, the house gets destroyed and gets rebuilt. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Everybody say new. New. Old has passed away. All things, everything. All the frame, all the foundation, all the wiring, all the roof, all the wallpaper. They don't do wallpaper. Sheet rock. I don't know. I'm sorry. That slipped. I know if I didn't correct that, you wouldn't hear another thing I said. This is also called the new birth. Born again. I fear, guys, especially in the Bible Belt South, that, that word just becomes a word. There's nothing more miraculous, more powerful more important in all the Bible than this one concept. You must be born again. So repentance means I'm willing to, and I know I must be remade. I must be remade. If that has not happened to you, that is what must happen. You cannot go 
into heaven in your natural state. The old creation cannot enter God's new creation. You must become new in order to enter the new. And the Bible is very clear. All things will. The heaven and earth itself will be made new. And quite, quite closely behind it, and we could say two sides to the same coin, is the word believe. Believe. Faith. Faith means you come to God for forgiveness and new life. Now, let me just pause for a minute because people get confused, and I, I've gotten confused. There is no emotional test for this. Some people cry. Some people don't. Some people feel joy. Some people feel hardly anything. It is a transaction with God from you to Him. You are responding to Him. Repent and believe. There is no emotional test, but let me just say this. All faith ultimately requires action. Everybody say action. All faith. This is what's been left out, and it's confused us about faith. All faith requires action. My wife showed me somebody posted, I think, on her Facebook Noah, you know Noah in the ark, right? Noah was not saved just because of grace, but because he obeyed. It was grace that saved Noah, but he had to act, didn't he? Had to build a boat, and then he had to get on it. All faith. There's no emotional test for faith. I've seen miracles, and I felt almost nothing, but it happened. But there was action almost every time needed to be taken. So the actions of our life reflect what we believe and who we're following and who we're looking to, how we live, our values, what we do with our time. The fact that you're here is a step of faith. Those that you've gave your tithe today or offering, that was a step of faith. You were expressing faith by your action. Those of you that worship, that was a step of faith, a prayer you pray, the way you order God into your life. Those are actions. But what is the action those are actions that result from real saving faith. But what is the act of saving faith? Paul is very clear in Romans 10, 9. And this scripture has helped me so much in the past, and I hope it helps you. It says that if you confess with your, what? Mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So there has to be a belief in the heart and a confession with the mouth. Now, that's the difference. Saving faith is faith that believes in the heart. Some of you have said, you know, you remember believing he died on the cross, but you weren't saved at the time. I've always believed in Jesus. I've always believed that he was who the Bible said he was. But I never acted on it for years and years. The moment I acted upon it, I got saved. What does it mean? I repented of my sins. I turned away. I, I didn't know what I was supposed to. People really hadn't told me. I remember I used to live so terrible and thought I was a Christian. It was, if you looked at my life, after I got saved in college, some of the Christians told me they didn't even want to come around me. They wanted to make sure it was real. I guess I was a loud sinner. I don't remember. I know it's hard for you to envision me like that. I can't even envision me like that. The actions of my life indicated I was lost. I was a sinner. I worshipped another God. Some of you know people, and they profess to be Christians, and there's no action. You can't just say, that's okay. It's not okay. They haven't repented, and they haven't believed in their heart. How many of you know what we do... Listen to me now for this and see if you agree. What we do indicates what we really believe. Right? What you really believe is what you're doing. So it's not like I got to match what I do with what I believe. You're already doing what you believe. If you have a hard time coming to church, guess what? That's what you believe. I'm not being true to what I believe. Yes, you are. You're being absolutely true to what you believe. You are acting on what you believe. And if you don't like your behavior, quit trying to change your behavior. Change your beliefs. That's just an axiom that we give when we counsel people. 
Because if I, don't, if I find behavior that's troubling to me, if I'm ever going to really change it, I have to drill down and go, why do I do that? Why do I do that? Because what I'm doing is I'm doing what I really believe. And I'm not going to change what I do unless I change what I believe. And if you want to be saved, you've got to believe in your heart. That means you act on who Jesus actually is. The very son of the living God, the Messiah. And as a result of that, eventually, you will do another one of the actions. You will confess with your mouth. And we're not going to make you come up here and confess it. I think it'd be helpful if you come down here and say, you know, I just want to profess Jesus as Lord. I've never said that to anybody. I've made that decision. But you know, there's some point at some time you need to tell somebody. If you, if you say you're a Christian and it's a surprise to everyone, you might want to examine that. <laughs> All along, surprise! It's like, we got married, but we don't want to tell anybody. Well, did you really get married? I got saved, but I don't want to tell anybody. Did you really get saved? I understand shyness. I understand fear. I understand all of that. But it's, there are some things important enough. You need to step out and say, this is who I am. Some of you right now, you're under pressure from people to do ungodly things. And the reason you're under pressure is because you've never come out and told them, I'm a follower of Jesus and I don't do that. You've been ashamed to tell people. You need to, if with the heart, man believes. With the mouth, confession. Now, this, this understanding of what it means to be saved, like I said, will deliver you from false security and false insecurity. And I've had both. So there were years I was told, pray this prayer, walk down the aisle. I did. Get baptized. I did. But I never, no one told me how to give my life to Jesus. No one told me how to repent of my sins. No one told me my actions determined what I actually believed. So I never examined my actions, which increasingly and rapidly got worse. So I had false security. I could have died in my sins and be in hell. I was, I was in a car wreck that I could have died. I, had, I told my 57 Chevy, I know, feel my pain. Feel my pain on that one. 17 years old, 70 miles an hour. Could have died, could have died. Been in hell today. All, up until that moment, I thought I was a Christian. And by the way, that near miss didn't get me saved. You ever wondered why people go, oh man, you're going to get saved now? I didn't. I had false security. And then I got saved. I gave my life to Jesus. And then, praise God, I'm really saved. I feel the peace of God. My desires change. I start going to church. I, quit, I talked a different way. I quit doing things that were sinful, that I knew were sinful. It was wonderful. But the enemy would come. You're not saved. You're not saved. So all the time I was really lost, he never told me once I wasn't saved. And I thought he was my friend. I'm talking about Satan now, in case you don't know who the enemy is. But when I get saved, the accuser comes and says, you're not saved, you're not saved, you're not saved, you're not saved, you're not saved. Torment, torment, torment. I, I, I wanted nothing more. But I read Romans 10. I go, whoa, 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 whoa. I put my heart in his hands. I've given my life to him. He is my Lord. I confess with my mouth. And the devil, the Bible says if I do this, I'm saved. And so get back, Jack. You know, get back. I'm saved. So I was delivered from false security by doing it right. And I'm delivered from false insecurity by doing it right. That's one of the reasons we've got to get it right. What does it mean to be saved? Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. The easiest way I like to tell people, and then I'm done. It's to say, it's to make Jesus Lord. To make Him Lord. Amen? Now, I just pray that this is, I've asked God, help me today. Make sure this is very clear to everyone who hears me. If it isn't, I ask you to pray about it. I ask you to read the scriptures I've given you. Meditate upon it. Own it. Make it yours. Get it right. Come to us if you can't. 
Go online, get the notes. Read the notes hopefully you've taken today. Be willing and able and ready to share this with anybody. Build relationships with people that you suspect don't know Jesus to give them a chance to hear the gospel. Amen? Because if this is the most important message in the Bible, can you agree with me that evangelism now becomes the most important activity? And evangelism, most of it that's effective is relational. We build relationships so they trust us. And then we reach out and tell them the most important thing in the world, amen, is how can a person be saved? Let's stand together. Let's pray together. Just, if you just, let me ask you to just bow your head for a minute. If today, if in this service, you, it's just you and God right now, you and God, if you know that God has come to you and God has reached you, reached out to you with his hand and pulled you out of the miry clay and pulled you out of a drowning river and pulled you out of a current that was taking you downstream and put you on a solid place and you know in your heart that you've given your life to Jesus. He is your Lord and you are saved. Would you just lift your hand to him right now and thank him for that most amazing gift whatever is not going on in your life hold Janet for a minute just thank you just thank you whatever is not going on in your life that you want to go on if that's going on can I just say you're going to be okay (laughs) a thousand years from now the rest you're not even going to remember a hundred years from now you're not going to remember thank him for the great gift of salvation thank him for the great gift of salvation thank you Lord thank you Jesus praise you God and I pray God that we will never cease to thank you for this amazing gift where, we're, where, where the part of us that has become new will be joined by the new creation the new heaven and the new earth forever and ever and we ask you Lord to help us reach out to people around us who are still drowning who are still being carried downstream help us please help us Lord help us ask God to help you Ask God to help you. Ask God to help you reach the people that you care about. Ask God to reach, to help you to reach the casual acquaintance as well as the personal friend or the family member. There's no more important message than this. There is nothing more important than this. There are many other great things God has given us, but there's nothing more important than this. And all comes down from this. All's downstream from this fountainhead of salvation. Thank you, Lord. And we ask you to help us now. Help each one of us. Reach the people we care about in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let me just, one more thing before I let you go. If you could not raise your hand right then, please know you are where we want you to be. You are where God wants you to be. We're not here to look down on you, condemn you. Thank God that you're in a place where you can hear the gospel and respond to it. Our prayer team is coming, and you can respond. Remember I said, Saving faith means action. Faith always means action. You can come as other people come for prayer for other needs. Some of you need to come for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. Some of you need to come for healing today, physical healing. But some of you need to come and just take the hand of one of our prayer team members and say, you know what, I just need to confess Jesus as Lord. I just need to tell somebody. And we want to pray with you. We want to help you take your next step with God. Or you can take a card, one of these yes cards that are in the seat back in front of you. Take a minute. And I found that people go, oh, I, I want to do that, but I don't want to, I'm not, I don't, don't want to sign anywhere. I don't, I don't, why do I have to? Listen, I, I believe God showed me this. If I want my name written down in the book of life up there, at some point down here, I need to sign somewhere. It's like marriage. I need to sign the marriage. I need to sign on the dotted line somewhere. I need to sign yes. If you're not willing to sign something somewhere, you're not ready follow Jesus because you're still keeping the back door open and God can't come to you and help you and pull you out of the river so come here or take a card and drop it on the way out or whatever but make a decision and start toward Jesus and begin this great journey God bless you bye